Greetings, programs, and welcome to the first of two episodes of Blistered Reviews this week. That's right, Thumb Wars is taking a break because now is the time known as none other than Square Enix Week! And there was much rejoicing. Yay. So, let us start things off right with Bravely Default. The crystal's glow wanes by the hour. Its fading light augurs a greater darkness. an odd few years for the venerable Final Fantasy franchise. Between the outright mistakes of Final Fantasy XIV's original launch, the lack of localization for Type-0, NEVER FORGET, the hideous abomination that was, ugh, all the bravest, and the controversy surrounding the Final Fantasy XIII subseries, it's difficult to argue that the FF brand has lost much of its former cachet among the larger hardcore gaming audience. Add in the issue of the ever-swelling budgets required for AAA games these days, and it should be clear why Square Enix has reached the conclusion they need to breathe some new life into one of their most important properties. They began this process with the fairly well-received relaunch of 14, subtitled A Realm Reborn, and in the wings waits the long-delayed and much-anticipated Final Fantasy 15 to hopefully help bring the franchise properly into a new generation of gaming with style and quality to spare. However, with 15 still a distant vision on the horizon for the immediate future, SE's next step in their attempt to regain their former reputation revolves chiefly around two titles. One nominally new, though in reality anything but, and one that's a capper to an already established subseries. It's the former, Bravely Default, that brings us here today, and based on it, Square Enix are definitely moving in the right direction. The Good Gameplay, graphics, audio, social elements, world building. The bad, thin plot, largely bland cast of characters, meh final boss. The ugly, a certain someone's first boss fight form managed to be perfectly stomach turning in all the right video game bad guy ways. Let's be clear right from the outset. Despite its title, Bravely Default is a Final Fantasy game in all but name. Indeed, it's basically an unofficial sequel to 2010's The Four Heroes of Light for DS, right down to most of the major bosses of that game being available as optional bosses in BD. As such, many familiar elements from the FF series are present in Bravely Default, I'll bet sometimes under new names. Thus, while there may be no chocobos or moogles, the game does still feature crystals, airships, elemental spells, and even four champions that end up being given the moniker of the Warriors of Light. This is a game that has clearly been designed as a throwback to the early NES and SNES Final Fantasy titles, and indeed, fans of those classics should feel right at home in Bravely Default. Bravely Default is set in the world of Luxendark, which the game describes as a land of light and shadow, and as the game opens, a massive earthquake causes the entirety of a simple farming village to be destroyed, leaving only one survivor, a seemingly ordinary young man by the name of Tiz Arier. This event is only a herald to greater disaster yet to come, and soon the world has been plunged into chaos as the oceans become poisonous and devoid of life, 
the winds stop blowing, earthquakes become common, and volcanoes begin to rage out of control all over the world. In the wake of all this tragedy, Tiz meets Agnes Oblige, the 20-year-old Vestal, i.e. Priestess, of the Wind Crystal, who it turns out is the key to awakening the four crystals that can restore Luxendark to its former pristine glory. Unfortunately, a powerful country known as the Duchy of Eternia has set its sights on Agnes, who they blame for all the troubles besetting the world. And soon the two young people must join forces with the amnesic Lothario Ringabel and a former commander of Eternia named Adia Lee, who turns against her own country's forces when she learns of the terrible and murderous tactics they are employing to achieve their goals. In other words, Bravely Default uses a completely boilerplate RPG setup for its story. And indeed, that is the majority of the game's narrative in a nutshell. Aside from a few small flourishes like Lux and Dark being somewhat more technologically evolved than a typical fantasy world, the game's airships, for example, make use of both magical crystals and internal combustion engines, there are a few elements of the game's overall narrative that will feel original. Indeed, most of them have even been tackled before by Square Enix itself in the course of the Final Fantasy franchise. This in and of itself is not a problem, mind you, and indeed a lack of originality is not really the game's biggest storytelling sin. What's more problematic is how thin the plot was at times, with a lot of development being crammed into the game's final hours a la the original Final Fantasy I. Too often, Bravely Default's story felt rote, and it's clear that the developers were more focused on establishing the overall world of Lux and Dark than giving players any kind of particularly compelling plot to enjoy. In terms of character and theme, the game also seems to suffer from an odd dissonance that it's really difficult for me to detail without completely spoiling everything. What I will say is that once what is really going on becomes clear, the hiring practices of certain individuals on both sides do not make a lot of sense. Also, the game has an unfortunate habit of introducing new potentially interesting enemies only to have players kill them off mere moments later, which does tend to limit their ability to be memorable antagonists. This includes the game's fairly blah final boss, though in that regards, this is only in keeping with FF tradition. See Cloud of Darkness, Zermus, etc. Still, it's hard to deny that the game's final boss is a non-character, especially when compared to his far more developed chief lieutenant, who frankly probably should have been the game's true ultimate antagonist anyways. Certainly, I was far more invested in taking that character down than I ever was the game's nominal main baddie. This often weak character writing also extended to two of the game's four leads, with Tiz and Agnes coming across as bland and forgettable throughout most of Bravely Default's 40 plus hour running time. Agnes at least does get the odd moment to shine, but Tiz might as well have been a silent protagonist for all the interesting things he has to say. However, to be fair, Ring a Bell and especially Adia do make for legitimately strong leads, even if the former's lech with a heart of gold shtick gets old fast and between them, they generate the majority of the game's most compelling dramatic moments. And hey, two out of four interesting main characters is still a better track record than the four Heroes of Light ever managed, so that's something. Ultimately, if Bravely Default is not as engaging on a narrative level as the games it's trying to emulate, i.e. the 16-bit era FF titles, neither is it as dramatically inert as some of the RPGs I've been forced to play in recent years. <coughs> Neptunia, <coughs> The Hollow Knights 3, it's not the best story Square Enix has ever dreamed up, but it's also far from the worst. And overall, it's a narrative that both newer RPG fans and old-timers alike should find at least mildly entertaining. Which, for now at least, is enough in light of just how brilliant and compelling Bravely Default's gameplay is. To be sure, this is more an evolution of the classic FFATB system than a revolution, but to older players, that may actually be preferable. Any longtime RPG fan should find BD's combat comfortingly familiar, and newcomers will also find it incredibly accessible. But that's not to say the game simply relies on past glories for its successes. Instead, the game uses the introduction of a major system into the mix as a way of making what was old new again. In Bravely Default, all actions cost at least one Brave Point, and players can spend up to four Brave Points per turn, but doing so means they have no points for an equal number of following turns. Conversely, players can also Default, which is essentially the game's version of Defend, and in addition to increasing a character's defenses, also stores up an additional Brave Point for use later. It's a classic risk-reward system that's further enhanced by what is perhaps the most refined and interesting version of the classic FF job systems that Square Enix has yet to produce. 
On top of all the usual choices like Knight, Ninja, White Mage, Red Mage, Summoner, etc., players can also add more esoteric options to their arsenal, such as Pirate, Vampire, Valkyrie, Merchant, and more, for a grand total of 22 jobs. Each job has specific weapons and armor that they're best suited for, and players can also equip a limited number of abilities they can learn from whichever given job they're actively using. In addition to their currently equipped job, each character can also use the job commands of a second job, which means, for example, a red mage, which in Bravely Default can make use of both white and black magic, could also equip the time mage or summoner job commands for a fuller range of magical options. Or, a thief can equip the merchant job commands and thus literally sell enemies back the items they've just had stolen from them. As that last example should make clear, BD offers players a plethora of strategies and approaches to combat that makes fighting foes a real joy. Yet the player's ability to customize the game does not stop there, and everything from the rate of enemy encounters to the difficulty and even speed of fights can be adjusted. Rounding out Bravely Default's major gameplay elements are a social component which might sound groan-worthy to those burned by past bad mobile and or free meme experiences, including SE's own atrocious, and thankfully completely unrelated, Final Fantasy All the Bravest. But fear not. Bravely Default is a textbook example of how to implement such elements into a game correctly. To begin with, players will early on gain access to a village that they can repair in order to build a variety of shops that unlock items, weapons, armor, accessories, and even special move components that cannot be attained anywhere else in the game. Also, as shops are enhanced, the village will begin to regularly send players various gifts in the form of healing, attacking, and crafting items. In order to build and enhance these shops, players will need to recruit villagers, and they can do so in a variety of ways. One is by having friends who play Bravely Default, and another is via the standard Street Pass option, but it's the third option where BD's real brilliance lies. Every day, players can go online via the save function and recruit between three and four random people to their village. It's as simple as that, and it means that almost anyone who plays the game should be able to reliably make use of the village system effectively. Also present in Bradley Default is a system wherein players can equip a recruited villager to one of their party members in order to access any job commands and abilities that villager has already learned. Players can also send and receive powerful extra attacks from one another that could definitely be a tide turner during tricky fights when used correctly. Finally, players have at their disposal sleep points, which accrue whenever the game is put in sleep mode at a rate of 1 per every 8 hours of sleep, for a maximum total of 3. These grant players extra turns during combat, and can be used at any time even if a character has no brave points. Players can also buy more sleep points via in-game purchases made using real-world currency, but I want to be clear that the need to do so is completely optional and easy to ignore if players so desire which is exactly the way a system in a game like this should be. I made it through huge chunks of Bravely Default without ever using my sleep points, and even when I did, they were hardly an instant win button. Nor did I ever spend an additional cent on Bravely Default beyond what it cost me to initially buy the game. Frankly, those having trouble with a fight would find setting the game temporarily to easy mode to be a far more effective option than stocking up on sleep points in my opinion. Overall, Bravely Default is a true triumph that could stand proudly next to the best of Square Enix's past classics. While the game is somewhat lacking in the story department, it makes up for this failing via a handful of strong characters, an interesting and diverse world, some amazing gameplay, top-notch visuals, and a wonderfully lush score. Those who bemoan the disappearance of the Square Enix of old need look no further than BD for a game that is both traditional and forward-looking. Make no mistake, this is a must-buy title for all 3DS owners, and if you're an RPG fan who has yet to purchase the system, then you're missing out on some of the best the genre has to offer today. 2013 was a remarkable year for the 3DS by anyone's standards, and if BD is anything to judge by, 2014 is going to keep that trend going strong and then some. Here's hoping that Bravely Default is only the first of many amazing adventures to come in the land of Luxendark. Score, 9 out of 10. Must own. Recommendation, buy it now.